Greetings, everyone. This is Yoftahe Mulatu Gabru from the Yoftahe Show on our regular broadcast on Wednesday night. And then we have another one on Saturday at 12 noon. Uh, today, celebrating the Black History Month of February, I have brought you Mr. Holton Box, who's in the industry over 30 years and uh, um, a millionaire who has a successful, who has built over 45 individuals to become millionaires. Most of the time we talk about racism or as black or brown people, what we can and cannot do. But today is a testimony of Mr. Bags uh, Halton being here on the show to show us what kind of vision we need to have in order to be successful in America. Uh, so without overdue, let me just come back to you. Uh, Halton, this is an honor having you on the Yoftahe show. Um, I've been watching you for a while and then have attended uh, so many of your trainings. Uh, for me, it's an inspiration hearing you um, overcome so many uh, hurdles and then being where you are. Uh, so for those people who don't know you, if you can just introduce yourself a little bit then. Of course, of course. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure of, of, uh, of mine uh, to be on this show, specifically uh, during Black History Month. So I'm, I was honored that you would have um, asked me and, and I'm grateful to be able to share. Um, you know, just for the audience uh, to be able to get to know a little little bit about me so you'll understand the reference from which I, I speak and come. I um, I was born in Tampa, Florida. I spent um, my first 16 years there. I was the oldest son of three who lived with me. And, and um, I went off to to college at the age of 17, football scholarship, and um, started to pursue my dreams. You know, being the oldest son and being the big brother, you have to set a great example. And I thought I was doing just that by going off to college. First person in my family to ever uh, to go off and and uh, go to college. And um, so I got there and got really excited about the opportunities I saw. And I saw specifically in Houston, Texas, I saw a lot of African-Americans uh, who were succeeding and I decided to make this my home. Um, I met my wife at the age of, uh, uh, I was 13, she was 12. We were bro boyfriend and girlfriend at that time. But uh, two weeks after we started our dating, I told her that she was gonna be my wife. And, and so now we've been married uh, uh, now over 27 years, been together over 30, maybe five years or something like that. And um, so I came to Houston one, uh, a year before her. She came a year after after me and uh, decided to make it my home. I uh, went through a lot of um, uh, ups and downs uh, in business and from a financial standpoint, um, always, um, you know, pers pursued the route of entrepreneurship and uh, went through a lot of ups and downs. I found myself around about the age of 25. I was a quarter of a million dollars in debt. Uh, I was 45 days away from foreclosure. I just got my car repossessed and uh, we were just about to have a son. And that was kind of my rock bottom moment. And I remember saying to myself, hey, I'm a, I, I live in America. People come here for opportunity. And why is it that I can't get my, why can't I get my act together? Why can't I get, take care of my financial obligations? Living in America, all of this opportunity around me. And uh, instead of looking at all the excuses and the reasons of why things weren't happening, you know, um, I did. I made it happen and uh, started a series of businesses. Um, and um, one, you know, one after the other, several have succeeded. And um, a couple of them were what I call home runs if you, or grand slams, if you will. And so uh, my number of failures in terms of attempts at business are much greater than my successes. Uh, but all it takes is one or two grand slams and they overshadow all of the strikeouts that I've had in business. And so I'm now currently the CEO of iBoomerang, which is a technology driven company that uh, the foundation is network marketing. I spent the last uh, 30 years in the industry of network marketing. I've built teams um, in probably now 180 countries around the world. Uh, I've done billions of dollars of revenue. Uh, doing it all from home and uh, never borrowed one dime, never needed a loan to do it. Started it all with my own money and uh, with small, meager money. Maybe we'll talk about that. But um, that's my current and um, um, biggest project that I'm working on now. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I own several different companies as well. But that's my focus right now of, of a vehicle that I'm using to impact and change the world. 
Thank you. Um, as we're talking about Black History Month, for me, two icons that I always stand is like King Minilik of Ethiopia, who defeated the Italian colonialism, saying that I'm not going to sell my country, I'm not going to be colonized by anyone, and gave us independence. We've never been colonized in Ethiopia. And then Malcolm X also stood head up and understood what we have to stand up for. So I always want to give credit because for me to be able to stand up and share who I am, I always rely on Malcolm X, what he has went through. Who is Whose shoulders do you stand on? You know, Adam, um, great question. I, I actually stand on the shoulders of, of many. Um, but to be more particular, I, I, my, I stand on the shoulders of my mother, uh, my mother, my dad, uh, my grandfather, and my grandmother. And I'll tell you why. Uh, my mom, um, you know, obviously um, the, the, the the mother of three boys um, and living in our household, um, she was married, divorced. And so I was kind of the man of the house. And my mom molded me and gave me all of those sayings as a kid that, that you thought was so corny. And I look back on them now and it was nothing more than programming uh, or affirming, I would call them affirmations. Uh, uh, but it was more preparation for the future, the future Holton Bugs that she knew uh, would actually be faced with life's challenges. And, um, and so when I hear voices uh, in my head telling me what I can do, I hear hers. Uh, I've read many books, uh, but I, I don't hear all the voices of the books and the audios I've written uh, that I've listened to. I, I hear her voice, and, you know, my dad, my grandfather, and my grandmother, incredible examples. My grandfather had a fourth grade education, um, and um, but he was a very successful entrepreneur, uh, owned a lot of real estate in Tampa, Florida, a uh, particular area called Ybor City. He owned a lot of it. Uh, my grandmother, you know, she worked uh, from home, uh, or really was a housewife, but her job, of what she did was she actually she was a seamstress and she um, tailored clothing for oversized uh, women because I don't, there wasn't many options back then. And that was a service that she wanted to give to the community. It wasn't necessarily for money. And so my grandfather was an entrepreneur. Uh, he taught me a lot of work ethic. While kids were out there playing football and basketball on the weekends, I had to get in his old uh, station wagon wagon and uh, we used to sell eggs. And so he would drive and I would be in the passenger seat yelling out of the window, egg man, egg man. And we'd drive around neighborhoods and and the ladies would sit on the front porch. If they raised their hand, I'd jump out of the car, go get a flat of eggs, take them up there, get $2.25 and bring the money back. And uh, and that's how I how I am living. So for me, even though I, 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 I didn't like the fact that I couldn't play with my friends during those times, I look back on it now and said, that's exactly what I needed, that work ethic. So I stand on their their shoulders. Uh, my dad, you know, serial entrepreneur as well. So I stand on their shoulders. There's a lot of people that I can give credit to, but, uh, you know, my mom, my dad, and my grandparents. Okay, great. Um, it's great giving you honors to our parents, so I really appreciate that. Um, so just some of the questions that I have received, um, because sometimes I tell people that I mean, they look at you, you're successful, but they forget where you have started or sometimes people like think like you've been handed over, you inherited something. So there are so many things people will think and prevent them from doing, from accomplishing something. Maybe sometimes they even use it as an excuse not to do anything because if you're successful is because you received A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. So for people to understand, I know you mentioned it a little bit at the beginning, where did you start from uh, so that people can understand a little bit what, what kind of childhood did you have? Listen, my, I, I wasn't handed anything except an example. Uh, and, and everyone has an example, uh, regardless of whether that example is in your household, uh, if that example is on television, if that example is in a book or an audio tape or, on, or right now. Uh, if you have access to a smartphone, everyone in the world has an example. And so I don't buy the excuses of I didn't have an example. And so mine was at home. And I remember when I was in the, uh, I think I was in the first or uh, maybe second, third grade or something like, well, no, fourth grade. Um, 
I wanted um, I wanted my own bicycle. And my grandfather comes home, he brought, bought me a used bicycle, me and my cousin. And my bicycle that he bought me had this huge, long, what we call the banana seat. And my cousin's bicycle had the nice uh, sport seat that was on there, you know, for BMX. And so my bicycle was really looked like a female's bicycle. And, you know, as a young kid, that's not what you want as a, as a, as a young boy. You can't do any tricks on it. And so um, I asked him, you know, hey, I want I grant that grandpa, you know, I, I want to I want a new bicycle. I want to. He says, well, you know, you get your own. And so what I did is I, I realized that it, if it was if I was going to get it, I had to earn it. And so what I would do is I noticed the kids at school where I went to school. Uh, we would after school was over, I went to a private school. And after school was over, we'd go to the playground area of the school until the parents would come pick us up. School would be over at three. Some parents wouldn't come until five o'clock. Well, between three and five, guess what kicks in with all of that energy? Hunger. Well, we've already had lunch. So what I did is I start popping popcorn before I went to school early in the morning and putting them in sandwich bags. And I'd sell each sandwich bag of popcorn for 25 cents. And on my way to school, I would stop by this little, other little store and get the little candies that were one cent and not sell them for a nickel. And uh, and so I sold enough popcorn, sold enough candy uh, that I could buy my own bicycle. And so that was, you know, that was kind of how some of the things that I did as a young kid to learn work ethic and to learn uh, that nothing was going to get handed to me, that I had to go out there and work for. So those were that was kind of how my childhood was. And it and it kind of grew. And I kind of I. Um, I, I never forget, uh, maybe I was in the fifth grade. I had a paper route um, that I used to throw what was called the Florida Sentinel. It was a newspaper and I would go and I had to get the Florida Sentinels. They were 25 cents and 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 I, they'd give me a bundle of them and give me a route and I'd have to, you know, throw those out uh, or sell them uh, to people who wanted a Florida Sentinel. And I'd come back, bring them the money. And they give me whatever the difference was, and that was weekend money for me as well. And then my 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 dad opened up. Uh, my dad and my uncle opened up a uh, a little convenience store, and so uh, I would work there after school. And so I never forget when minimum wage was four dollars per hour. Actually, it was three dollars and thirty five cents. Then it went to four dollars per hour. Um, they paid me two dollars per hour. And I would say, well, dad, I can go to McDonald's and make more money there. He says, well, go work for McDonald's. And but I always wanted to work around family. And so I accepted the two dollars per hour. And and the good thing was that I wasn't given anything. You know, during the high school times, I never forget. I wanted I wanted uh, a car. Well, nobody was going to buy me a car. I'm sorry, during junior high, I wanted a car. And um, and so I learned the trade of cutting hair. I became the neighborhood barber. No license, but people would come to my my dad's uh, to the store where we, you know, where I would work on weekends. We had a, a kitchen net in the back, and um, and people would come, and I charge them four dollars for a haircut. When everybody else, the other barbers, were charging five, I charge four, and um, and so it was just one thing that led to another. And I always found a way to say, hey, listen. If there's a need somewhere, let me fill that need and make, let me make money. And today, quite a few people do what's comfortable. You know, you, if you told a kid to do that today, some of them, not all of them, some of them, oh, well, I don't want to do that. That's beneath me. I don't want to, you know, I don't know how to cut hair. Well, I didn't either until I learned, <laughs> you know, and, and, and so, uh, but I, I look at those things and I see that those things, though, that's what gave me the advantage. It wasn't money nobody had any money to give me you know they didn't they didn't have any money to give me but they gave me their their experience and they gave me lessons and so i tell people to to this day uh the same thing happened with me and for, for my son who's 20 23 now i've never given him allowance ever when he was a kid i don't pay a child to clean a room that's theirs <laughs> I, mean, I think it's a bad example I, why should i pay you to wash dishes or to pay you to take out trash uh, or pay you for, for you to go have fun on the weekend. That's called a vacation. And you haven't worked. I think it's the I think it's one of the oddest things that that cripples most teenagers from being able to be self-sufficient, in my opinion. 
And uh, so I never did any of those things for him uh, whatsoever. And, and now when I look back and I see how he earns money to this day, those same lessons are passed on. So the, the, the inheritance is not what you leave to your children. It's what you leave in them. And, and that's, what, that's what's most important. Amen to that. So, I mean, speaking of that, like, I mean, you just told us you come from a humble beginning. You didn't have it empty handed. And then if we go around in most black neighborhoods, we do a lot of, unfortunately, to the point I call it desperation. And most of the kids have been thinking sometimes they cannot go past 21, 22 years old. And then they, that seems to be sometimes being successful is making it to 25. And a lot of time that you hear because of racism, because the government, because of so many things that you hear. If you look at that, why do you think is in so many of our black neighborhoods are not successful or really uh, in the pretty much, I want to call it ghettos areas. Why do you think is that? Um, you know, I, th I think there's, there's quite a few reasons um, uh, for it, you know, um, but I think one of the key reasons is miseducation. Uh, there's a lot of education, so it's not that those neighborhoods are not educated. They are educated, um, but the miseducation and and all and, and the miseducation typically stems from the parents. I think we teach a lot of old philosophies that were handed down to us that are antiquated and no longer relevant. Um, you know, I think we teach a lot of processes and and thought processes that we hand down to our children that are useless and they're, and, and, and they're wasteful. Uh, I, I, my personal belief, and you know me, I speak my mind, my personal belief is I think that we are unintentionally setting our children up for failure. I, I certainly believe that in the majority of our, in, in these neighborhoods, when you talk about these ghettos and, 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 and what we call the hood, and that's where I grew up, Ponce de Leon Projects, Tampa, Florida. It was the hood. You can't get any more hood than that. But, you know, the pressures that are on children and kids today uh, are, hey, listen, you know, who's going to go? Wh where are you going to go to college? What are you going to study? And, and the social pressures of identifying with a profession, a title today is so strong on our, on our kids today. And I think it sets many of them up for failure. Um, and so, you know, if you have not been properly prepared uh, for what that life looks like, and then you start to pursue and you start to see that, uh, that, that maybe that's not the route that you want to go, but you feel forced into it because this is the only route. My only route out is I go to college or I do the things that, that, people are using to make money here in my neighborhood. So let me give you a prime example. Um, we are forcing kids to go to college uh, these days. We force them to go out there and, and go to college and get college loans. They get the college loans, they go to school, and here's what happens. Those loans that they get to go to school, there's no guarantee of a job whatsoever. And I'm not against college at all but there's no guarantee of it. The, much of the education that we go to college for is antiquated by the time we're ready to use it. When you take a look at the number of people who go to school, the majority of people who graduate with a degree don't end up working in that field and they change jobs multiple times and they change industries multiple times without ever using the education that they receive. But why, why aren't we telling our kids today, see, if you went into a neighborhood and told most African-Americans, hey, listen, why don't you go to plumbing school? They look at you crazy. Why? Because what's synonymous with the plumber? You know, maybe the overweight guy with his pants where you can see the crack of his butt bending over with the, with the wrench. But plumbers make over six figures a year. And we don't teach that. We don't teach trades. We don't t tell them, hey, go be an electrician. Go to school for a year, become an electrician on all of these type of jobs that are high paying skill based jobs because we are teaching children today to actually identify with college based off of status. It looks good. And so many of the parents who didn't have a chance to go to college, they live through their children and they want their kid to be the first person to go to college because it now becomes a great reflection on their 
uh, uh, on their scorecard of how I raise my child. So when you look at it in these in, in these quote unquote the ghettos, the, the parents that they want the kids to go to college. Why? That's all they know. They think that if they go to college, I've succeeded. Well, I went to college. I'm the first to go in my family to go to college, but I'm also the first in my family to drop out. I don't have a college degree at all. And so I didn't I didn't understand all of that. And I thought, man, you know, my mom would always tell me, she says, son, even when I became financially independent, I never forget. I I, um, I I remember when I was a millionaire many times over. My mom didn't understand that millionaire stuff. She would always tell me she said she whispered. She said, son, listen, you need to go back to school and get your education because it's something that they, that's something that they can never take away from you. And my thought process was, who wants to take it? Why would anybody want to steal it? You know, and so but it was miseducation. Her thinking, no matter how many millions I had, she still thinks that the college degree is what substantiates me as a man. And that was mis mis miseducation, unintentional. But this is one of the biggest reasons that we have that. Why not go to trade school for a year, two years, cut out the expenses, don't have this huge debt load of, of, of because you, if you're in the get, you don't have the money to go to college. So you either have to be extremely sharp, smart, and, and, and have a, 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 a specific educational pattern, you know, that you've got to have in order to get a scholarship or else you're going to have Pell Grants and student loans. And then you carry those student loans into something. And guess what happens? If you don't get a job, guess what still do? The payment on the loan. Guess what cannot be written off? The student loans. Student loans were written for banks to make money, not for people to get education. And I'm not down on education. I'm just big on the proper direction of how you educate a society. And I think we've been uh, miseducated uh, in so many uh, proportions. Now, you want to be a doctor? Guess where you better go? You better go to college. You want to be a lawyer? Guess where you better go? You better go to college. You want to be a dentist? You want to be an accountant? You want to be a professional? Go to college. But stop hurting everybody through this process saying you got to go to college. Because right now, Adam, let me let me share with you who's who, who's who's got the real information. The 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 new wealth CEOs, the, the, the new tech CEOs, when you look at the biggest companies in the world today, now they're saying a college degree or education is no longer required to work here. What's it what's what's required is an exceptional talent, is a skill. If you can do the job, they don't care about what your what college you come from anymore. But that has not made it down to grandma or auntie or mom yet, because we're still thinking that that diploma that we put on the wall is what makes us um, a, a relevant human being in this society. And, and so we've got to do different and do a little bit better and, and give them other options than putting them in an environment that makes them feel their self, that, that suffers or stifles their self image because they say, I don't speak like that. I don't, that's not my interest level. I don't study like that. These tests right here, you know, when I take a standardized test to get in college, you know, SATs and ACTs, those standardized tests and IQ tests, those things were, were developed by who? By white men, nothing wrong with that. But that, that vernacular and that culture is what's needed in order to excel with those particular tests. And so coming from a, the hood, it, it's, it's culturally, there's a huge cultural divide. And so many of them feel that's not me. Adam, I scored an 860 SAT scores. Me. Which uni what university wants me? None. That was my, listen, I scored an 860 the first time. I took it again. It dropped to 820. <laughs> I started to take it a third time and I said, I might be in the seven, so I'm not even going to take it. Why? Am I talented? Exceptionally talented. But I came from the hood and and, and the stuff that was there and the things that I had to learn and read, I wasn't equipped. 
Nobody, we didn't have the tools. You know, I wasn't prepared for, for that. Other kids were. And I'm not saying that this is for everyone, but it just wasn't there for me. And, and, and enough people are not standing up saying, you're talented. This is not the only path. And that's one, that's one of the biggest divides that I see that's there. It's great. I think you're taking me to the next question. Uh, um, so you, just like we say, you can't give what you don't have. So right. most of the parents or the neighborhood, if they're not educated and if they don't have this information, there's always that vicious cycle that's going to go on. They're going to learn exactly what they see with the surrounding. And there is a lid that's already put in and someone has to help or I don't know who might be. So what would you be your advice or who can go in and open that lid to show kids, the neighborhood, the parents to say there is a different way. This is not the only way. So how do we open that lid? How do we um, show there is a different way? I think I think you're doing your part. I, I think this is how it's done because you 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 can't pour from an empty cup. I can't ex I, I can't expect the mother of three who's 24 years old right now living in in subsidized homes uh, right now, getting food assistance and housing assistance and doing all she can to raise those three children. I can't expect her to know what I'm to, to, to know what I know. So I can't expect her to to pour from that cup into those kids. And, and so what it is, we've heard the we've heard the term each one teach one. And so what we've got to do is we got to continue doing things like this. And the exposure must be out there. So if you're watching this right now and you know a mother who's raising kids and you've heard another parent talking to their kids, telling them you better study, get good grades and 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 punishing their kids because the grades aren't great. You send them this video. Let them hear it from me. And it may be just one person that it affects, but how many other people can be doing videos like this and, 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 and putting it out there and getting that exposure? It doesn't solve the entire problem, but it starts the process. That's what needs to happen. We just have limited exposure. I didn't know a world existed of success if I wasn't a professional football player or if I didn't get a college degree. I didn't. I didn't know that a world existed for me. So my options, my, my, I had very limited options, but I remember going to school in high school with my white counterparts. I never for, forget, I had good friends of mine, a friend of mine named Seth, Jewish gentleman. And, and I remember for, you know, and Seth would all, he, he'd get the nice cars, you know, when he turned 16, he bought him a brand new Supra, $70,000 car. And I'm, I'm like, how do y'all do this? And I remember for the summer, we we're about to take summer break. Seth, what are you doing for the summer? Oh, I'm going to be managing my dad's stock portfolio for the summer. You're going to be what? What's a portfolio? I thought it was a folder. A portfolio. <laughs> I had that. I didn't understand. I just didn't understand. And so he and I, we're in the same school. We're listening from the same teacher. But his experience and exposure level was far greater than mine. I think I kind of caught up a little bit, if you know what I mean, you know. But but I I was I was hungry. And I want you to imagine the kid that was in the same class with him who wasn't so hungry went right along with what was put in front of him. Whatever the path was that the teacher chose for him, that's what they went with. I just happened to be that one who's going to swim against the current and say, there's got to be a better way and I'm going to find it. But I wasn't the guy who's going to do everything the teacher said to do because I already knew I couldn't compete with those guys. I felt bad sometimes studying, putting in hours after hours. Why can't I get, and I wanted to, I wanted to get the best grades in, in school. But that wasn't my skill learning that. My skill was an emotional skill of understanding people, bringing people together, communication. But nobody told me I could make money by being a leader. There was no leadership class that I knew of in high school. There was no there was no there was no scholarships for leaders, only scholarships for 
supremely sharp and smart people and athletes. And I was fortunate that I did get the athletic scholarship. Thank you. Wow. Um, so um, it just brings me to what you just discussed about the power of influence. Um, when someone like you or we talk about because um, they are in the sport, they make it big, whatever we consider rich, and then they have able to close that gap of wealth and able to make it. What do you think is the responsibility or is there any responsibility to go back and lift that hood, lift that area? Because you, like you said, you don't expect uh, the mother of three who never really got taught or saw something. Is there someone somewhere like someone like you or someone else that can go in or is there any, any kind, should we have any kind of that kind of expectation? I, I, you know, I don't like putting expect. I don't like putting uh, expectations uh, on, on people when they have worked hard for what they and specifically if nothing's been given to them. Now we know nobody does it alone. I don't call myself a self-made millionaire because, like I told you, I stood on the shoulders of many giants. Um, I choose to accept the responsibility to go back. But for me to say that the next person, it's your responsibility to be a role model, that's not, now I'm judging that person if they choose not to. Because they have the right to say, listen, I played by the rules, I bothered nobody, I went out there, I paid the price, I've earned my money, I'm a multi-made, I'm free, and all I wanna do is live my life as a hermit. I can't look at that person and say, you're doing something wrong, that's not right. That's judgment. Now. I wouldn't do that, but I believe we have enough people who are willing to go out here and give back, who are willing to go into communities, who are willing to get on shows like this and talk about what it takes. There's certain things that I'm willing to do. I had a gentleman of mine today who called me up, actually sent me a voicemail, and he said, man, listen, you know, as a CEO, I don't, I, I see a lot of things that we do as a company from a charitable standpoint. You know, I don't see a lot of videos with you, you know, at, in kitchen serving meals and and, and with kids because that's I'm not going to do that. That's not what I, that's not genuine from my heart. Me, an image of me serving a meal feeds nobody. Me working my butt off and creating opportunity and creating money that I can donate feeds nations. But pictures and videos of me, that's just not what I'm going to do. I'm not a stage person. I'm not going to get up there and do it for the cameras. I'm not going to do it do it to make a political uh, appearance. If I do it, it's because it's what I want to do from my own heart. Uh, but um, but I don't want to be judged because I'm not going to stand in the line and hand out turkeys. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I, I I I place the expectation on me to say. Yes, I have a responsibility. People need to know uh, what it is that that that's required, but I, I can't place it on anybody else. Uh, I'd love to see it and I, I I applaud it, but I don't place the expectation on anybody. That's good. Um, for, if you have to pick uh, what's the uh, ingredient of success, I mean, we will come back with, I mean, actually, let's do that because success has different meaning for everyone. And for people, when they were, they compare some, themselves to someone else or whatever. So what, is, what does success means to you? Success to me is the progressive realization of a worthwhile dream or goal. Um, I don't think you ever obtain success. I think success is something that you keep getting closer and closer and closer to. That's why I say a progressive realization um you know it, it it's it's like the you know uh in, in tampa where i grew up we had the dog track and it's where the dogs would run around and chase they take they'd spray this this uh little fur rabbit with this rabbit like spray and and, and and make the dogs chase and and what happens is the greyhounds will run around the track and this little rabbit, they think they're chasing a real rabbit and they'd always make sure the rabbit's running faster, just a little bit faster than the greyhound. But every now and then, a greyhound would, 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 would actually outrun that little mechanical uh, rabbit and get the rabbit. 
And once that greyhound gets the rabbit, the greyhound never runs fast like that ever again. Why? Successful. And so success for me is not a destination. Uh, it's the, it, 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 it is the progressive uh, realization and continuation of a worthwhile dream. I think once you've set some goals that you want to accomplish and, and you have done something to make a situation, a person, the world or yourself a better version of you or the world or whatever it is, I think that is that is the makings of success. I don't think it I don't think it has anything to do with money necessarily. I think money is a scorecard for success in business. So I do business to create a profit. If I have no money, that means I'm not good at it. That means I'm not successful at my business. But if I have a lot of money, it means that I am succeeding at my craft. Okay. But what, what, you know, my contribution may have been, or your contribution may be, you know, being a great wife, being a great husband. And so maybe I'm not rich. I don't earn money from being a great wife or from being a great husband. But if I contributed and I made my wife or my husband more empowered, I did things in my community to spread awareness and things of that nature. And I'm just talking about my grandmother right now. She was extremely successful. I never see her collect a dollar in her life. Very successful. And so it's a progressive realization of a worthwhile dream or goal is how I define success. Um, bring me to the next question. You just remind me when you talk about the rabbit, uh, when Usain Bolt ran and broke the record, the, the person who came second and the third also broke the rec record. And then when they were asked, you never ran this fast, how did you do it? They said, I was just trying to catch up to Usain Bolt. <laughs> so with that, it brings me how, how big our vision should be or something that we aim. Because like you said, success, if you reach it and if that's when you stop, then uh, uh, I don't want to call you, you die, but it's, everything is going to stop. So what would be your advice to you how to always aim high and then move that needle when you reach it to always keep moving forward? So what would be your advice on that? I learned something years ago from uh, a pastor. His name is Pastor Robert Schuler. And, and I, I learned this listening to an audio about 25 years ago. It's called the peak to peak principle. If you've ever been skiing, um, you'll notice that there's, you know, you get on, you start at the base of the, of the mountain or the hill. And then they put you in, you know, the, the, the ski slope, um, the lift. And, and what you'll notice is that when you're at the base of the mountain and you look up, you see the peak of that first hill and you're like, wow, that's pretty far up there. And then they put you in the lift and you start to escalate up that lift. And when you get about three quarters up and you're almost can see over the top, what you'll notice behind it is another hill. You couldn't see it from the base of it. And but that's when you're able to say, wow, there is more after this one. And then if you continue on and you get three quarters up the way that that one, guess what you notice on the other side of that one? A higher hill. Okay. And, and that's how success is. And that's, that's how uh, life, that's how, that's really just how life is. And so if one chooses to live their life in what I call the peak to peak principle, and I tell people, when you start, don't start and try to get all the way up to the top hill first. Clear the first one. And, know, and then once you clear the first one, set another goal. Because why? You're better. You doing and repeating the exact same thing you did. And if you didn't move any of the, the, uh, the, the, the finish line, you're not better than you were the first time. Matter of fact, you're less. So you've got to go out there and do a little bit more so that, you, as I call it, progressive realization. 
That means you've got to have progress. And so you set those little peak to peak goals. And, uh, and I think when you live your life like that, it takes the pressure off of you of trying to make quantum leaps to the end from the very beginning. And you're able to now take bite sized pieces out of that challenge uh, that we call um, obstacles to success. Thank you. Um, with that success, I mean, like you said earlier, you mentioned it. Um, there is failure into it, and some people don't even try, don't even start. And sometimes the saying that the start before before you have everything lined up, or even the so some people that like, they want everything lined up before they take any kind of action. And um, for those people who are listening, they are afraid of failure, or they saw someone else fail and just they stay in that comfort zone and then they don't want to try something new. Uh, what is the relationship to success and failure when they look at it? How should they define or how should they have a relationship with failure? Well, you know, um, there's, I don't believe in failure. I believe in quitting. I don't believe you fail. I believe people quit. And, 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 um, I've had what I call fail. I've had fail episodes of failure. But just because I read or watch an episode doesn't mean I've watched the entire show. Just because I read a chapter doesn't mean doesn't mean that I've that I've read the entire book. Okay, and, and, and so some people get to a chapter and they don't like the chapter, so they quit. And that chapter may be the obstacle. And you look at that obstacle and you consider it, okay, well now, you know, I failed. No, it's just a chapter. I just told you, I didn't pass all of my classes, but I still got out of school, but I didn't do the best at all of them. And, and so, you know, you, you balance those things. You don't have to have everything lined up perfectly. What you need to have is you've got to have a clear idea of what your path to success ideally would be in your head and on paper. And once you've done that, it doesn't have to be a perfect idea, but at least have the first 20% written down. Why? Because if you think you're going to start a process on paper, and finish it like it is on paper with no changes, you're fooling yourself. It doesn't work that way. Get your first 20% down. What is the, what are the, if there were 10 steps that you had to do to complete, at least know step one and step two, and you get started. Why? Because by the time you finish step one, you're going to know a whole lot more about step three of what's required for step three than thinking that you got to line all of them up. Okay. By the time you get to step two, you're going to realize, man, here's what I'm going to need before I even get to step five. But trying to do it all and trying to be perfect before you start, that's called quitting before you get started. And what happens is some people use perfection as a failure tool. And what I mean is they try to perfect everything before they get started and they never get started. I've got a, a, a guy that I knew and I never forget, he was developing a software program for a company. And he had it all worked out. He had the owners on his side. They, he was developing it. It was something that was gonna really help them out. It was gonna be a great tool he, I knew and he knew what the type of result was going to be financially for him and his family. It was going to be great. And every time I saw him, he said, it's not ready yet. I'm, I'm still working on some of this. I got to make it right and I got to make it right. And then I saw him again six months later and it wasn't ready yet. And it wasn't ready yet because it wasn't perfect for him. And then I saw him a year later. Hey, how's the project going? You know what? It's not ready yet. Not ready yet. And guess what happened two years later? That company was already out of business. And so because he was getting ready to get ready and he thrived on perfection, what it was is sometimes that perfection is fear of failure, fear of running into obstacles. And so so I don't have to be accountable to anyone of telling them I failed. 
let me make it so perfect that I never get started. Now, we don't say that to people, but internally, our subconscious mind actually communicates that to ourselves. And that's why we keep doing what I call getting ready to get ready. We're getting ready to get ready. The company that I uh, that I founded right now, that I'm the CEO of, in January, uh, two years ago in January, I decided that I was going to launch this technology company in January. That was on January the 20th. February the 19th, we were in pre-launch. Most people take six months to prepare to launch a company. I decided I was going to launch a company. I knew the first 20% of what I needed to get done. So what I did is I made sure I got that 20% in place and then we ran. And so the philosophy that I had was I am going to jump first, making sure I've got all the materials for my parachute and I'll make sure that I mend the parachute on my way down. I am not going to sit there and try to make every single thing perfect because my opportunity to jump may be expired. That's good. Um, with that, I think one thing I want to add up, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you, the way you describe failure, but some of the things that people are afraid of is criticism. And then I always say, don't take any criticism for anybody you wouldn't take advice from. Uh, so when is it? Or how do you pick the person? I mean, if you have a coach who is helping you grow, and then if you take those criticism, I can understand. So how does the diff what is the difference between criticism or for people who just criticize because they have never done it? Or they just, I mean, I always look at it. If I'm watching a, a soccer game or a basketball game, and if a player mess up, says, get him out. He's not doing this, but I'm sitting on the couch. I'm not even playing. I'm not even moving, but I am very easy to judge the other person as if like I'm part of it when I'm not, I am not. have not even taken an inch. So when we take criticism or, or people just uh, call it, get demoralized by criticism, how should they handle it or how should they pick that criticism, that, who they are receiving it from? I think that's the most critical part. It's who you're receiving it from. You got to remember, the majority of people, uh, they want validation and they can't handle someone telling them uh, something to correct the actions because it makes them feel invalidated or inadequate or it makes them feel unsuccessful. Now, here's, here's the part that I want you to understand. Regardless of who they are, if they're giving you something corrective about what you did, it's all criticism. It, it is what it is. Don't put yourself in the position, if you know you're very sensitive, to receive corrective information from somebody that you really love and care about. Why? That's who normally shut you down. I can tell you right now, I can take criticism from the world. But if I get off of a conference call and my wife says, honey, you forgot to say this. I'm done. I, and, 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 and the next conference call I do, my confidence is shook. But every time I get off of a conference call, you know what she does? She lies to me. She tells me, baby, you know, that was the best conference call I've ever heard you do. You must, you crushed that call. But my ego and my spirit doesn't know the difference between truth and the lie. And so it makes me better every single time. Now, give me my coach. I don't want my coach telling me I did incredible. I want my coach letting me know exactly how to improve and what I need to do to improve. Okay. And so I want you to realize this and ladies on this call here, if you've got a significant other or a husband or whatever it is, and it's the same with you fellas, you've got to be very careful because they may be looking at you as their spouse. And I don't want corrective information about my craft that I work so hard on from my spouse. You know what I want? 
I want reaffir- uh, you know, reaffirmation. I want her to reaffirm that I'm the hero. They may sound this. You may say, well, no, don't you want the truth? No, I don't. The truth, the truth will hurt me from her at that moment. This is why I'll have somebody who I can handle the truth from. And what I need is I need her building me up because that relationship that I have is so close that when I hear great things from her, it empowers me. But if I hear, babe, you messed up on this and you didn't say that right. And why did you do this right here? And and man, you, you know what? You missed this entire part of the presentation. And I'm just I'm shook. I'm shook. But if I have one of my leaders call me or if I have a mentor or a coach or something like that, call me and say, hey, listen, let me share with you. Let me share with you what you did. Good. And I always give criticism in three ways. And if this is you here and if you're sensitive, always tell the person who's giving you criticism. Tell, hey, listen, do it when you criticize me or give me corrective action. Do it in three parts. What? Tell them what. Here's what I like best about what you just did. Second is, here's what I like the least about what you did. Third is, here's what I would like to see more of, okay? And what I've learned is that when I am coaching my students, I use that format and that format allows them to receive that information differently because they know that I'm talking about their task, not them. But when my wife, comes in, I it, it's me she's talking about. It's the, the, why? My job is to protect her, to be her hero. And how are you gonna tell the hero his cape is not on the right way, <laughs> you know? And so, um, but you're gonna get it. And, and, and critics who are out there that you don't care about, um, hopefully you don't let them, don't let them deter you. Use it as fuel. When someone says that I can't do something, um, first of all, it's none of my business what they think, but I, I just find a way to use it as fuel. I, I don't let it hit me. If I don't care about you or if I don't have a connection with you, I, I'm not going to let what, what you have to say stop me. Why? Because then you win. And I'm a very competitive person, so I don't let people win. I'm not going to let you win that easy. All you have to do is say something bad about me and I quit. Oh, no. It, it, it just you're never going to succeed like that. Use it as fuel. Okay. Um, how do you pick the right coach? Because in a different area, stage uh, could be financial, could be spiritual. So you, at that point, you're going to have to understand who is the right coach for what stage of your life you're at. So how do you pick the right coach and at what moment of time that you know you think you need to have a coach? Okay. Well, if you don't think you need a coach, it means that you need a coach. <laughs> And, and and so uh, it means you always need one. And you choose your coach just like you choose your golf club on the golf course. When you go out and play golf, you have to remember, you know, you, you're allowed to have 14 clubs in your bag. You've never seen anybody play golf with only one club in their bag. So if I need a sand wedge, it's because I've got a shot that's going to be, you know, 100 yards or less. So I'm going to choose that particular club for this situation. But if I'm trying to drive the ball 300 yards down the golf course, a sand wedge is not going to do it. I now need my driver. If I've got a mid-range or if I'm on the green and I've got a a, a three-foot shot to the hole, I'm using a putter. And so I, and it's the same. So if I, if I've got a issue and it, and and I've got a challenge of, you know, financially, I'm not going to go to my my broke pastor, you know, uh, and, and, and just because he's my pastor. No. But if I've got a spiritual conflict, if I want more education about, you know, uh, my spirituality and he's my coach, you know what? He's that coach in that in that in that golf bag. If I've got, uh, you know, a, a, a situation with my with my kid and I don't know how to handle that situation. I may not go to my pastor either. Just because he's my pastor or she's my pastor doesn't mean I, you know, people, this is one of the mistakes that they make. 
is that they put all of their eggs in one basket thinking that one person is the dominant influence of information for my entire life. No, you need multiple coaches. And so who is it that has a healthy marriage? Uh, who is it that has a healthy uh, relationship with their kids? I had a challenge with my son uh, about two years ago, and he and I were butting heads because I was teaching him the basics of being self-sufficient, and he was into music and wanting to be an artist. And and being an artist, you don't make a lot of money in the very beginning. And, I, and so my words seemed like they were falling on deaf ears. And so... Who did I call? I didn't I didn't go call my pastor. I called T.D. Jakes, who's a mentor of mine. I called Les Brown, who's a mentor of mine. And I got both of them on the phone. Why did I call them? T.D. Jakes has five children. Les has 10 children. Why would I call someone who, who doesn't who's never dealt with my issue? I don't want textbook answers. I want an answer from someone who has experienced the challenge that I have. One of the challenges that we have that leave us unsuccessful is that many of us go to seek answers from pre people who have our exact same problem. And that will not help you get to where you want to go. Choose your coaches like you choose your golf club. Different experience, different challenge. I need, a, I need somebody with this level of experience. And in the beginning, you may start off with one coach, but start choosing people who 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 exhibit skill sets and qualities in your in their life that you would love to model not who teach skill set that you'll love to model they exhibit it they exhibit it that's what you want you want someone who models the thing that you would love to have and that's going to be your best coach and it doesn't have to be you know th these don't have to be wealthy people, but they have to be people who model what it is that you're looking for. Amazing, amazing. We're going to have our youth leaders join us. Uh, you've been uh, giving us so many information that I definitely been amazing. So I have, there was another person who was supposed to join us, Jerry, but because of Dallas, no, they have no electricity. So Jerry, I wish you well. I'll have you on the next program. And I have two use right now, actually three, uh, who will have some questions for you, uh, Halton. Uh, first, okay. Abraham, if you can introduce yourself and tell us also your age and then uh, what you do. Okay, thank you for the conversation. Um, my name is Abraham Gedehan. I'm a 17-year-old uh, high school student and uh, I live in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. Awesome. Nice to meet you, Abraham. Nice to meet you, too. Uh, then, my first question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Let's introduce them, and then we'll come to your question, Abraham. And then who do we have? Nardos? Hi, I'm Nardos. Tell us. Hi. Hi. And I'm 15, almost 16, and I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Cambridge, Massachusetts. I've been all over the world. I haven't been to Massachusetts yet. Gotta be in. That's where I am too. So we're gonna have to invite him. <laughs> Who's next to you, Nardos? My sister. My name is My name is Salam Tesfe, and I'm her sister. And I'm What's a student. Your name again? Salam Tesfe. Salam, okay. Yep. Nice to meet you. And um, I'm a 17 year old high school student and I'm also from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay. Hey, awesome. Great to have you. And I wanted to bring some use in this conversation because this is all about what the next generation need to learn from all of us to be able to see the, how bright the future is, what they need to do, having the right mindset. And then you have here, Mr. Bags that has all the right mindset for all of you to be able to see successful. So listen, that's all I'm gonna say. So Abraham, go ahead with your question. Okay. My first question was, uh, as a high school student wanting to go to college soon, what are some important skill sets that you think um, we need to develop well, let me ask you a question. Uh, what is it that you want to do um, with your with your college education? So, what field are you looking to to go into? Probably towards the computer science field. Okay. So, I'll share this with you here. Uh, going in, going into college, I think the biggest skill that you want to utilize is communication. Okay. Um, you, 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 and when I say communication, the ability 
to communicate what it is that you really want, what it is that you really mean, um, and, and the ability to build relationships, authentic relationships in a network, okay? Why is that? Uh, I'll tell you this, and, and I, Abraham, I speak very candidly all the time, okay? Uh, is, is, your, is your goal to be to do coding or anything of that nature? Something like that? Uh, I'm not entirely sure of the specifics, but probably somewhat similar to coding. Okay. All right. So what I would tell you is this here. As you go for your education uh, in computer science, and you should do that. If that's your goal, you do that. Uh, always understand the direction of where, where the future is going. Okay. Uh, computer science, our world is going towards a technology, to, to, towards more of, I believe we'll go to what's called a technocracy versus a democracy, in my opinion. So I think t uh, technology is very, very, very important. Um, but the people, if you want to be extremely successful, and I would assume that not only you want to do that, you want to be extremely successful, make a lot of money. What you want to do is you want to be the relationship person who also knows everything that you need to know about technology. Why is that? Because the direction that things are going now, coders, that's going to be what's called a basic element of, of, uh, of employment at some point in time in, in the near future. Right now, it's like, you know, it's a high level thing, but it will become not so high level because it's a big, huge necessity in that field. But communication, leadership skills, you want to be at some point the person who leads the projects for everyone who comes in who's an incredible coder. I, I have recognized that the people who built the biggest networks, the best networks, the best relationships while they were in college uh, are the people who actually were, who built the, the, the largest amount uh, of well-rounded success, uh, if you will. And, um, and, and that's what I would, I, I would say. Um, people in, in that field normally are used to being a little introverted because we're in front of a computer all day long and that's our world. Uh, and I, I will never tell anyone to change who they are, but uh, wow. be, that, be that person, you be the person who has the answers for a lot of people. And, and I promise you, not only will your degree take you far, but because of those other intangible skill sets that you can't put a figure on or a stamp and say he's got a degree, people will recognize it and you'll become the leader. And, and remember this, the highest paid profession in the world is called leadership. No matter what you do, you, you develop that leadership skill. If you become a part of science clubs or computer clubs or whatever it is, don't be the one when they say, hey, listen, we're looking for someone to be the president of this group that you sit back and 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 wait. For. No, you be the person who jumps in and leadership and participate. Those things will take you uh, very, very far because that's what you really do. That's what you're going to be doing. Either you're going to be doing it or somebody's going to be planning it for you. And guess who makes the most money? The one who's planning it for others. Yeah. Thank you for the advice. Absolutely. Okay. We'll come back to second question for you, Abraham. Let me go to Nardos and Salam, and then I'll go, come back to you. Nardos, what's your question? Um, okay, so for my first question is, what are some classes high school students in all levels of expertise can take to understand the fundamentals of business and entrepreneurship? Great question. Uh, you know, the, the, the best thing to do is, is, um, is really start to identify people um, that, you know, right now, if you take a look at what you guys uh, follow and how well-versed many of our youth is on Instagram and TikTok and all of that stuff, I, I think it's a very useful tool, very useful tool. Identify people that you admire, that, that maybe you connect with who may be business people and listen to their podcast. You don't have to enroll in a, in a class. You don't have... Education these days is completely different. There's nothing in this world I can't learn uh, for free on YouTube. Anything that they teach in a university, I can find it on TikTok. I'll give you an example. I knew nothing, I mean nothing, about investing in stocks. During the pandemic, I got a little bored. I said, you know what? Let me just start playing around with some of this stuff on a common sense basis. 
So I started, I downloaded Robinhood because I heard everybody using this Robinhood thing and investing and I knew nothing. I was intimidated in the beginning because reading charts and all of this stuff, just, I just didn't know anything about it. And, um, and so I, I started using just some common sense and saying, well, if everybody's at home, things like Zoom probably will go up. Things like Carnival Cruise Lines probably will go down. Travel's going to go down and things are going to, certain things are going to go up. So I start making a little bit. And I said, I want to take this a little further. And guess what I did? I went on TikTok and I start following people who knew how to do day trading. Well, and so I tell people I have a degree from TTU, TikTok University. And my entire skill set over the last 90 days has come 100% from TikTok that showed me how to earn several hundred thousands of dollars of profits from trading stocks. If I would have gone and enrolled in someone's class, my 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 learning curve, it would have taken much longer. Um, and I'm not going to say I wouldn't be as successful, but the learning curve would have been much longer. And so, yes, can you go and enroll in some classes for business? You can. But I just I just keep it real. Find people who are doing it. The majority of the professors that you learn from, they're not doing it. They know about it. They've learned it. They're not doing it. I went to school for engineering. My professor had never worked as an engineer. He read about it. He passed, it. He passed all the classes, but he never was an engineer. And so who would you want to learn from? If you wanted to get into music, do you want to learn from somebody who, who may be read about it? Or do you want to learn from somebody like Jay-Z? Definitely someone like Jay-Z. Who's done it? And so what I want you to do is understand these tools that you have, incredible. I tune out all of the, the crap. It's a lot of crap that's out there. I follow those who have what it is that I want. And I promise you, any business skill that you want, I can go with you right now on TikTok and show you how to find it. And I can show you how to cut your learning curve, learn it for free, and start applying it right away. And so just understand that that our world has changed. And, and, and this is what I talked about in the beginning is we're so antiquated. We've got our kids thinking that we got to learn everything in a, in a structured you know, environment in a classroom because that's what we that's what they teach us. Hey, go to school and hang around all the kids and listen to a teacher. That's old. Your your education. I, I own 16 corporations, never been to one business school. But I learned it from people who owned the business, you know, and so today and I don't mean to. I don't make things sound poo poo. I'm just a realist. I'm like, I'm the guy who's going to tell you the real truth. I'm not the guy who's going to sugarcoat it and say the same thing that everybody's been saying that is completely wrong. Nobody gives a crap about MBAs anymore. People can go to school, get an MBA. Owners of companies these days, CEOs, they don't give a, they don't, they don't care that you have an MBA. Can you do the job? So go learn how to do the job from somebody who's succeeding. And, and that will, I promise you, it will make you so much, you'll be so well-rounded and so prepared, specifically right now. You're 15 years old. You are a force to be reckoned with if when you start to learn processes from other people who are doing what you want to do versus, okay, let me go get another book because I can tell you're very well-spoken, you're well-read, uh, you're very intelligent. Now what the next step for you is, is to get real life application and add that to your level of intelligence. That's what's very, very, that's what makes, what makes you, no one can compete against you. No one can. And, and when you, when you add that level to your, you know, to your, uh, your resume, so to speak. Uh, but I don't, I don't discount the intellect or the formal education. I don't discount that at all, but anybody can do that these days. And people all over the world are doing that. And it, and it doesn't allow you to separate yourself. You got to remember the world today will pay you for separation. And what I mean by separation is things that you can do that your counterparts can't. 
that's where you're unique. You know, I'll speak to Abraham on this one and maybe, and, and, and I don't, and, and I'll speak from a sports analogy. Okay. And I'll speak to both of you because I'm sure both of you can relate. Why is it that Tom Brady gets paid when he gets paid? Because nobody else can do what he does. <laughs> Who are you going to choose? Why is it that Serena Williams earns what she earns? Nobody else can do what she does. Okay. And, and so the, the success in life is going to be about what distinguishes me from the other person. Why is it that I've earned what I've earned? And why is it that I can command the attention worldwide? Because nobody else has done what I've done. I'm not saying nobody else who's African-American. I, I don't. I don't rate myself by saying I'm the best African-American because when I say that, I immediately limit myself. Nobody in the world has done what I've done in, in business in my category, period. That's why my name is in history as the highest earning person in my profession. Not the highest earning black, the highest earning period because I've separated myself completely from anybody else. And that's what you want. Not that, not that you're trying to make someone else less than and you become better. It's just that I've got a tool set and that's what you've got to say. What separates me from the other student over there? Because remember this, if you were coming to work for my company, okay, and Abraham, regardless of what both of your degrees are going to be in, but let's just say that, you know, that you were going to come work for my company. And Nardos, you turned in your resume and Abraham, you turned in your resume. Who's going to get the job? Not, not competing between you two. You know who's going to get the job? The person that has a skill set outside of what I posted as a requirement to apply for the job, but the person who has an additional skill set that's more that that separates them from all other applicants. That's who's going to get it. Not the one who has the highest GPA. Not the one. I don't care about if you got straight A's. I, I never got straight A's. Never in my life. My wife did. But I didn't. I don't care about that. I'm looking for something unique about you. When, when you when when you sat in the interview. How did you communicate? How did you connect with me? Did you make me feel like I wanted to be around you? Those things, I promise you, I select people to work for me based off of things that have nothing to do with their resume. The fact that you submitted your resume, it just means that you're qualified to do the work. That's not the only step. That's not even the most important one. That's what gets you into the door. Now, your job is to define what separates me from anyone else. Thank you. HP, I think we're losing connection a little bit. Uh, you are cut, you are in and out, so I wasn't sure. You know, I get, I get, I get excited when I talk, so it's probably <laughs> my, my excitement and my passion, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Salam, what's your question? So earlier, as I was uh, listening, I heard the story about you and your friend Seth and also your other white counterparts working and how you had to work like almost twice as hard to get to where they were and just like studying and taking that time to like get to where they're. I don't know if it, I'm kind of misheard if it was a race thing or that if it was like um where your resources are like what resources you have but that struck to me because like I've had like a personal connection with in school and like being trying to be uh like catching up with my white uh, counterparts because I'm usually the only black person or the only person of color in honors and AP classes so I was wondering like uh just like outside of that just like how you combated that and like what obstacles did you face and how did you combat um, like this, these situations? 
Well, with me, when I gave the example, and it's a great question that you asked, Salam, it wasn't necessarily about race. It was more about exposure. Um, and, and, and I was using that as an example of what we are exposed to versus, um, you know, how advanced some other cultures are. And it's not a strike against them or an extra benefit to them and a strike against me. It's just a reality. You know, um, I didn't know what a port. He says he's managing his dad's portfolio for the summer. I'm thinking and I didn't want to ask another question because I sounded crazy. What's a portfolio? I'm thinking it's a folder, you know, your portfolio folder. But it was a stock portfolio that he was managing. And, and, and so um, but that I went to a school that was predominantly white. OK, uh, high school. And it was a good mix, but predominantly white. And um, I have always felt comfortable being me. OK, I, I, I like me. And I always knew I was good enough. And so what I do is I flip it on its head. What I mean by that is I feel I have the advantage. I've never felt a disadvantage. And I, and I don't want to take away from, from the social injustice and social and economic uh, disenfranchisement that I know really does exist. I'm not one of those who say, no, it's equal for everybody. That's not true. It's not equal for everybody. It's not, okay? But I wasn't gonna be a victim to it, not to myself. I flipped it on its head and I said, you know, when I walk into the room, here's what they're gonna see. Most people specifically, not most, but some, some of my friends, and I don't want you to ever make this mistake. My friends who come to me and they step into the room with their blackness first, it's a mistake. Well, I'm a black businessman. I'm not a black businessman. I am a extremely successful businessman who happens to be black. So I don't go in trying to promote my culture or, or my where I'm from first. Why? It's obvious. I shouldn't have to explain to anybody that I'm black. This is not a tan, by the way. I shouldn't have to explain that. I walk in with my qualifications first and I make them forget about my color because I'm that good at what I do. And so I looked at it as, as an advantage. There's one of me, there's 18 of you. And, and so that's how mentally in my mindset I actually use it. I never looked at it like, wow, I'm the only brother in here. And man, this is this is gonna, you know, this is gonna hurt. No. <laughs> I'm the only brother in here. I don't like, I ain't gotta compete with nobody else. Like, oh, this is a cakewalk. Why? Because I already knew I don't put myself in positions where number one, whereas I can't compete. I don't. Okay. You ruin your self-image that way. So no, was I ever going to be in a, a math competition? No, I'm not showing up. <laughs> I, I, I'm not showing up. Why? I already knew calculus was kicking my butt. Okay, <laughs> but but I find out what I'm good at, and that's where I compete. That's where I'm going to put my skill set. But when I walk in, they don't see my blackness first. If you don't know me, you may that may be what you physically see. As soon as I open my mouth, you're forgetting about I'm black. And this brother believes in what he's talking about, and he knows his stuff. That's what I want them thinking. And that's what you want them feeling and thinking. And when you walk out of that room, what you what what you leave with them is your skill set. And they don't discuss your color often at all. They want that skill set. They want what you have to offer that nobody else has been able to offer. And so I just flipped it on his head. That's what I did. And, 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 and it may not be easy for everybody else to do and compartmentalize that, but it's just, it's just how, I, how I navigated myself and how I succeeded. But it's not only in white communities. I've, I've channeled myself to be good at what I do first, and I lead with that first. You know, um, I run from people who come up to me saying stupid stuff like, hey, you know, I love to do business with you. I'm a Christian businessman. I, I leave. 
I don't want to hear it. <laughs> okay. Why, why do I leave? Because you're, you're now pedestalizing your belief system over your qualifications in business. This is, I'm, 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 we're not at church right now. I don't need to know what your religion is. I need to, are you a qualified? I'd love for you to come and say, hey, listen, I'm a qualified businessman who happens to be Christian. Then come into me wanting to, to, to do business with me and you're going to leave with I'm a Christian businessman. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a black businessman. Don't leave. I, I never led with that. I led with my, with, with my competitive edge and my skill set first. And then everything else was obvious. Hopefully that answers your question, Shalom. Good. Abraham, back at you with your second question. My other question was, uh, I think you touched up on this a little bit, but how important was networking and building relationships for your success personally? Paramount. 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 I told my son when he went to school, he went to school. Uh, I Like you know, I told you, I was one that I, I wasn't going to beat him over the head to go to college. I know how my son is. He's He was just like me. And so he could have gone to any school in the world that he wanted to. And I said, what do you want to do? He says, dad, I love music. I want to be a musician. Okay, no problem. Well, go to music school. So he went to Los Angeles School of Recording. And he get he got there. He says, dad, everything they're trying to teach me, I already know it. I said, I didn't send you to school to learn music, son. Nobody can. They're not going to teach you how to sing. You already know how to do it. I sent you there because you're going to be in a university or a college that has videographers, a college that have engineers for music, a college that have vocal coaches, a college that have choreography. Your job is to go there and to network and know all of those people. Why? You're going to school for music, but you may end up shooting uh, for music, but you may end up in the movie industry. You don't you don't know. And, and so when I was young, I thought that my life was going to be what I thought it was going to be coming out of college. Or when I decided that I had graduated, that was when I finished school, when I decided I, I had enough credits. Um, and I thought this was going to be my path. And I'll share it with all of you. Your path is going to change. Not necessarily, I'm not just talking about your career. It's going to change. And, and so when it does change, who's that phone call you're going to make? You want to know why P. Diddy is so successful? Regardless of all the, whether you like him personal or not, look at the, go back and research the network that he built of people when he was in college. All of them are multimillionaires today. Look at LeBron James. Who is LeBron James' money manager? The people he, he networked with. Who is his agent? The people he networked with. Who is it that handles all of his business affairs? He was able to take his network and build a, 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 an empire that is approaching a $1 billion empire. It's not just because he was skillful at basketball. It was because of his network. He knew he was going to be a, a, a star athlete. I should have somebody who's in the entertainment field as a, in a close relationship. And, and so he had all of those. So when you do go to school, your job is your job is to build a network. Your job is to know people. Here's what you do. You find someone who's in the field that you want to work in, who's very successful. Ask them, what are the key critical components of personnel that's needed in order for the company to be successful? And those are the type of people you want to make sure you build relationships with. Why? Because you may be starting your own company one day. You don't know. You know, and, and so networking is critical. That's where my success comes from. It comes from networking. There's not a country around the world right now that I can't go to and somebody welcome me into their house to stay and wouldn't want me to go to a hotel because of the relationships that I've built. So if I need something in Italy, guess what? I know who to pick up. I can pick up the phone and call Marco. Marco's going to get things taken care of in it. If I need something over in Spain, I know who to pick up the phone and call. If I need something over in this country, that country, here, over there, anywhere around the world, it's because my network will influence your net worth. So, yes, your network. Make it important. Don't take it for granted. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'll just back at you. What's your second question? My second question is, what was your motivation to get to where you are today, despite your race and the generation you're currently living in? Okay. Um, well, here's the thing. I never looked at it. I, I, I never looked at it. And, I, and I'll make one little adjustment. It wasn't despite my race. And I know you said despite your race. But um, I my motivation... I never looked at my race and wanted to and use that as a reason I had to do something. Um, I can't change what my race is. I can't even if I wanted to. Um, I didn't. I wanted. I wanted to take care of my family. Period. I, I could have been white, and as poor as we were, I was going to have that same motivation. It wasn't. It wouldn't have disappeared because I was white. I would have been white and poor. I would have did the exact same thing. Well, I didn't like living where I was living. I didn't like not having things that I thought were essential. So I grew up in high school. I didn't have a phone. We didn't have a house phone. We didn't have a car. We didn't have those, those type of necessities. Things like food and meals every day, three meals a day. That was not... That was not like abundant for for me. You know, my wife and I, we've been together since she was 12 and I was 13. I would have to walk across the street to the laundromat. And I remember when, you know, pay phones were a quarter and I and I'd, I'd make sure I had my quarter so I can talk to her because we didn't have a house phone. But everybody else had one. It was normal for everybody else to have a house phone. And so having that desire to say, man, how, man, I, I want a phone. I'll be very candid with you. Um, it was simple stuff for me. I, it wasn't about being rich. It was just simple stuff. I don't want my mom to struggle the way she struggles. My mom was working multiple jobs, and and it was it was very difficult for her to just break even uh, for us. And she and she she wanted to make sure we had the you know at least had the necessities and the best. Um, and so. I felt the responsibility that, man, no, it's my job to get my mom out of the projects, you know? And so at first I thought I was going to do it with athletics. So I worked hard to, you know, to get a football scholarship, injured, busted up my shoulder in college. And uh, I realized this is not going to work. So I've got to, I've got to do it through academics. And so I got uh, an academic scholarship and got into Frederick Douglass Institute honors program at Texas Southern University. And, and I realized education, I didn't like it. I, I, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to sit in the room and study. That was not my personality. I saw the guys who were going to be good. I, I knew Lamont, I uh, forgot his last name. Now, I knew this guy was going to be a professor or something, somebody real smart. Cause I knew how he applied himself, but I knew that that wasn't for me. So I figured out I got to do something different. So I, I started little businesses and I realized I had a knack for being able to create a profit, take something, make it more valuable and be able to offer it to a person where they wanted it, show some more value to a person. And they wanted to exchange their money for the value that I created in their life. I became real good at that. I said, this is what I'm going to do. How I figured that out. I was doing an internship. I was working. Uh, I was. I told you I was going to school for engineering. I went to. Um, I did an internship because I'm trying to do everything that I thought was was right. I'm following the path. They say, "Hey, listen, go to school." I went to school. Uh, go to college. I go to college. They say, "Okay, well, if you want to do this, you got to become, you know, and en enroll in student government." So I did all of that. And you get to college, you got to go get internships. They don't want. You're not going to get hired if you don't have any experience. So I got involved. And I got internships. So I worked uh, at um, in in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. I was working for a company called Nipper, uh, National to National Institute for Petroleum and Energy Research. And I developed this this research uh, um, this research um, a study that I developed on, during my internship. And I never forget, I was there, and there were about two thousand scientists and engineers who worked there. And here's when I knew I had to do something different, when I knew I was not going to be happy as an engineer. Um, I had, um, this was my sophomore year in college at this time. 
And five o'clock is when everybody gets off of work and go home. I'm there. I'm paying, getting paid a thousand dollars a month as my stipend for this 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 internship. Uh, I was so bored. I got a job at Circuit City. Circuit City was a, a store like Best Buy where they sell electronics. But Circuit City had uh, commissions, and so I get off of work at five o'clock, go to work at six o'clock from six to nine. I never forget at five o'clock on a Friday one day. I didn't want to rush into my car to traffic. So I just kind of stayed in my, in my car, listened to my music while everybody else was leaving the, to beat traffic. I didn't have anywhere else to go at that time. I noticed here I am, I'm a sophomore in college. There's 2000 people here. Some of these people have been working here for 20 years and I'm looking around noticing I'm driving just as nice of a car as people who've been working in my field 20 years from now. You mean this is what I'm going to be driving 20 years from now? And I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Nobody told me this. Because they don't tell us to go out and interview and look at the life of the per, uh, 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 of the position that we want. They just say, here, this is the position. So here it came to me. And I was like, this is not what I want. These people are boring. These research scientists, they walk around. They have no personality. They... You know, nobody has great social skills. And 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 I got that job at Circuit City and I start making more money from six o'clock to nine o'clock, three hours a day than I was making per per month with my stipend. And I say sales is what I got to do for my life. I got to be involved with people. I got to. I found what my skill set was and then I became real good at that. Um, and, and so it, things it, things will change for you. Um, they, they always will change, but my motivation was, was really taking care of my, taking care of my family. And, and then I wanted nicer things and I wasn't embarrassed about it. Don't ever be embarrassed. If you ever want something nice or if you want to be rich, some people make you feel bad. You know, say, Hey, listen, you know, I, I give you an example. I've got, I remember one time I had two Rolls Royces and I had people tell me, you know, um, you can, you know, you can feed, you can feed a whole country of people and, you know, for what you paid for that Rolls Royce. <laughs> and I said, no, me not getting a Rolls Royce don't feed people. Me wanting a Rolls Royce and working my ass off is what feed people all around the world. And last year I fed over what? Seven million people last year. Yeah. So don't ever, don't ever let people will always throw they'll they'll throw stuff at you to make you feel bad for what you want or for what you don't want or whatever it is. And and I just don't pay any attention to it. But my motivation at that time was I just wanted to take care of mom, take care of the family. And um, and then now it's my motivation now is the more money I make, the more I can share my influence. People don't want to hear from broke people. So if you want to ever make an impact socially from a social responsible perspective, you 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 want to put yourself in a position where your voice matters. The more successful you become, the more people who want you to speak. Adam wouldn't invite it, wouldn't have invited me over here if I had launched our company and it failed the next month. He invited me here because I have a story to tell. And that's what that's what drives me now, being able to share my story, the money I don't necessarily worry about anymore. Do I take the money? Yes. Am I going to give it back? No. It's mine. I work for it. But now it's a little different. It's for significance. Now, in the beginning, I wanted to set my family up, whereas we had generational wealth that was going to start with me. And, and once I got that done, now you become free. So now I'm free. That's why I say the things that I want. I speak the way that I want to speak. Why? I don't have to worry about somebody saying, I'm sorry, we're going to have to let you go because you said something that you weren't supposed to say. I wanted that freedom and there's no better feeling than knowing that you're truly free. And I didn't become free until I was in my forties. That's good. Uh, before I give uh, Salam a chance, because you just mentioned about the 7 million, I want them to, to know about the Boom Foundation. If you can talk a little bit so that people can understand what you do, what you also provide. Yeah. Well, when I uh, started my company, there's a couple things that I do. I want to share this with you. And I don't talk a whole lot about it um, because I think doing it is more important than talking about it. 
But um, when my wife and I started our company, um, I wanted to make sure the same day we open our doors, we open up our doors for giving. I didn't want to be known as the uh, most successful company in our field. I wanted to be known as the, the company who made one of the biggest impacts. So we start, launched our company called the Boom, uh, our, our foundation called the Boom Foundation. And the Boom Foundation is where we, where we actually set a goal to eradicate child malnutrition around the world. We believe it can be completely eradicated, not just put a dent in it. And so I uh, uh, made it whereas any product, any customer that we had, whether they bought anything or not from us, if they accepted to be uh, a customer of ours um, and, and, and use a free technology, by, ex by accepting our technology, I feed a child. And, and so uh, we do that with every vertical that we have now. I started a ride share company called Vibe Rides uh, that uh, it's like Uber. And uh, every ride, we feed a child. Every time somebody takes a ride, we feed a child. Um, and, and so all the other services and products that we have in our company, we do that. And so uh, last year, I think it was a total of 7 million kids that we uh, that received um, uh, nutrition uh, from us. And, um, you know, we, 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 you know, doing things different places around the world, um, locally here in the United States as well. Um, but it's been, it's been really good. It's been really, really, really good. One of the things I do personally is um, I, um, 2014, 2015, I had some very successful years in business, very successful. And um, I, but I wasn't happy. Um, with my family, I was happy and, and, and health wise, we were good. But I was working with people who had, who didn't have a vision as big as mine. And it was the CEO of a company where I was the chief visionary officer. And I felt like a, uh, an eagle who had been put in a cage, spread my wings, but they could only go so far because I'm in a cage. And it made me almost depressed because I had these really big goals. And my wife would always say, what's wrong? I said, honey, I'm just not happy. She said, why? I said, I'm just not. She said, stop being selfish. And she said, go give to other people what you want. She says, what do you want? I say, happen. She said, go give it away. And every day what I did from that point on is I started making sure every day I did some deed that would make a person feel better about themselves. And the majority of the times, I would, if I'm giving something, I could not be present when they received it. So it could have been I can go to a restaurant like Waffle House that we have here. And my bill may be. 18 bucks and I'll leave a hundred dollar tip, but I couldn't be present. She couldn't know that it was, you know, I couldn't see her receive it because I didn't want any thanks for it. It was, I just wanted to do my part and, and make an impact. And I go into restaurants and go to the way, uh, to the manager and Hey, say, listen, I need you to help me out with something. She says, what is this? I need you to help me with my goal. And I said, I need to pay for everybody's bill that's in here, but nobody needs to know what's me. And I go in a restaurants are full. Um, it's just simple things like that. And I started off small. And here's what I noticed. I noticed the more I impacted people and, and the little that I did that meant so much to them, the happier I became. And they never knew it was me. So that it was not a point of what made me happy was people coming up saying thank you because they couldn't thank me. Um, but, and I started, you, you can start this and you don't have to be rich. You can start it with compliments. Just think about it. Who is it that you haven't called up in a while and said, I just want to call you and tell you, I love you. I just want to, you know, and send them a text. Hey, I just want to, I just want to let you know, you mean a lot to me. It, it, it's those little small things like that, that you can do. That means so much to people. It costs nothing. I just happen to have money and people need it. And so I get to give a little bit of that as well. But your kindness, your generosity, uh, your gifts, your talents, you're able to give those away. And it makes the world a better place. And I promise you, that's what that's where the real happiness comes from. It didn't come from me having the you know millions of dollars uh, uh, being earned. It came from me 
and not and not me giving millions. It came from little small things that I was doing every day. I see a lady coming across the street and I'll hold the door and I'll wait for her just to open the door. That's my deed for the day. You know, I see somebody's coming out of the grocery store and I, hey, ma'am, can I help you with your bags? I'm sitting on the airplane. I see a lady, she's got a bag. She, you know what, can I grab that for you and put it up, up top for you? It's just simple stuff like that. It, it, it doesn't cost a whole lot. So. Thank you. For those who want to know more about the Boom Foundation and how to field a child, I'll be sending a link. Send me a messenger and then I'll be able to provide you all a link to be able to get involved with that. <clears throat> Salam, what's your second question? Okay, so my second question is, how do you combat uh, procrastination? And in your opinion, why do you think that procrastination even exists? <laughs> that's a really, that's, that is a uh, a really 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 good one. Um, I want you to read a book called "The Magic of Thinking Big" by David J. Schwartz. Have you ever read that one? Okay, "The Magic of Thinking Big." Okay, um, and he talks about procrastination, but he also talks about something called the three C's. Um, and I'm not going to tell you what they are. I want you to read the book and you get it. Okay, but um, Here's the thing. Uh, have I, I, I am a big procrastinator. So here's how I manage it. I hired somebody who's not. <laughs> so what's my real answer? I don't have the answer. I'd be honest with you. I don't. I'm not going to tell, I'm not going to sit up here and give you the five steps to not becoming a procrastinator because I haven't mastered it. I haven't. What I here's what I realized is that um, I I've been able to live my life. I know that I procrastinate. I've missed some great opportunities because of it. But I have other skill sets uh, that are much more dominant than my ability to start a project when I'm supposed to start a project and finish it when I finish it because I'm not perfect and I'm not going to try to be perfect. If I if I wasn't if I wasn't a procrastinator, my wife would say, "Honey, you're perfect." And 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 I know I'm far from perfect. So, if there's a skill set that I'm lacking in, it's procrastination. But the thing I tell you is this here. Procrastination uh and lack of motivation are two different things. I'm extremely motivated. Extremely motivated. What I can tell you is that Sometimes my procrastination, I don't want to praise it, but my procrastination, I have been able to make up for it. And, and I'm able to accomplish a lot now in small time frames. But I stress everybody else out because the, my team who's around me, they're much more prepared, if you know what I mean. So getting on this call, I got the email about how to get the link probably yesterday. When did I get on to find the link? Five minutes before the call was supposed to start. <laughs> so I'm just letting you know you can have some faults and be successful too. <laughs> That's good. So you, I mean, you are the next leaders. I really appreciate you coming in and asking this question. A lot of parents are asking, we should have you back again, uh, HB, uh, because this has been uh, phenomenal. So I will let you go in so that because you have a night nice school and then you can get back to your homework. Like I said, listen to your parents, but read and understand that to stay motivated, all the things that you learned today, apply it. It's not only about listening, but making sure that you apply it. That's the only time you're gonna make any differences. So Abraham, thank you. Nardo, Salam, I'll talk to you guys more tomorrow, but I thank you and I give you back if you have homework to finish. So. Uh, I would say good night, and then you can still continue following us, and then I'll try to finalize it with HP. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, just, I, I, I just want to say this here. I listen to you guys' questions, and just the fact that Adam have you on here, I know that you're very special. I want you to know uh, that that you are good enough, the you that you are. I know that you're going to be improving and I know that you're going to become better and study harder. But I want the biggest thing that I want you to know is 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 that accept you and know I'm good enough just the way that I am. My, you know, whatever it is that you have, 
you're good enough to do it. If 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 this guy here, this big procrastinator here, okay, who scored 820 on his SATs and was afraid to take the ACT, if I can do what I have done, okay, starting from where I started from, you guys uh, can run the world. And, and I sincerely mean that you can accomplish whatever it is that you want to accomplish. And so anytime that Adam wants me back, if I could ever be of assistance to you guys uh, from a mentorship question, whatever it is that you have, get it to Adam. He'll send it to me. I'll make sure I respond to you guys. You guys are champions. I look forward to your success and actually listening to you guys on a podcast or a live Zoom talking about your success. Thank you, Mr. Bugs. You just gave me more ideas because if you, if you if you want to stay, just stay. And I have two more questions and then I'll finalize the show. So if you want to stay, just stay because you want to listen more. What is uh, a, a halting for you uh, for someone to be successful if they have to pick a day-to-day -day activity? Uh, what does your schedule look like from morning? What time you wake up? And then what does your day-to-day -day activity look like? Okay. Um, you know, as I told you guys, I, I, I come on here and I tell the truth. Um, and, and one of the biggest reasons I do that is because I hear speakers all over the world and what they do is many of them come on shows or speak and they do classes and they teach you what they've learned, not what they really do. And they give these canned responses of, Hey, I wake up in the morning and I organize my breakfast and this and this and this and this and this. And so I've got my whole life. It's so organized and it's so perfect. I don't have a schedule. I, I, I have I have calls that I have lined up. I mean, I don't have a a, a system of well, I'm going to do this, 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 this. No, I get up and I take a look at what's pressing right now. What is it that I that that I that I want to accomplish? And I start focusing on some of those things. Do I get distracted? Yes, I do. I get distracted throughout throughout the day. But I, I, I do operate on what I call the win formula. What's important now? WIN. And then what's important next? But I don't have this, you know, people always say, hey, can I just come in and and and, uh, and just sit a day with you and look at your schedule and see how you operate? I'm like, you'll be, you'll be confused. Because, you know, I run a large company and I have a dynamic life. Things change. So for me to say, I'm going to wake up and do this and this and this, that means that I am expecting my business to be the same two months from now that it is today. No, I've got to be able to adjust. I've got to be able to, to make some shifts. And so what I do works for my personality. However, don't you feel that if you are more structured than me, do not feel the need to be like me. Your structured pattern and your thought process of what you've rehearsed is perfectly fine for you. It doesn't work like that for me. I am the person, I understand how I learn. I'll give you an example. I'm a very slow reader. I read extremely slow. Unless I have loud music on my, on my ears, then I can read my brain operates different. When I learned who I was, I no longer was embarrassed. I thought there was something wrong because I didn't read like other kids. But I can do other things that they can't do. I can put on headphones, listen to music at the loudest. I can focus in and zone in and read. Why? My brain operates off of what I call distractions. A part of my brain has to be focused on something else so another part of my brain is relaxed and can read. I didn't know that until I got in my third, until I got in my twenties. And so I went through high school thinking I'm a horrible reader. And so, so I can stand on stage and Adam has seen me do, I stand on stage and I can speak in front of an audience of people for four hours with no notes, zero preparation. I can come on stage and, and I can write six words and I can give a four hour talk and keep everybody engaged. I can stand on stage and speak and in my mind, I can plan an entire event in my mind while I'm speaking. It's just, but that's how my mind operates. And so I utilize my skill sets and talents. Whereas I've, I've got people that if I don't give them a PowerPoint and give them every single subject and almost word that they need to say, they can't get on stage and do that. 
But guess what? They're good at doing it their way. I just realized I'm good enough the way I was built and the way my brain operates. So um, I don't have the day-to-day -day thing, Adam, of, of, of this is what I do. I come in my office. Now, here's some of the, here's what I do. I do. When I wake up, I do, I'll get up, make me some coffee. Uh, I'll do me some meditation uh, every now and then. Am I on it every day? Every No, just being honest with you, I'm not on it every day at this time. I don't do that. Um, and, um, and, and I'll, I'll take a look at, you know, what it is that I do have to do. Sometimes I'll call my assistant and, and get the day planning going. And then other times I don't, and she loved me to call her every single day. She's extremely structured. She writes everything down. She's extremely detailed, but I'm not. Okay. And it works for me, I'm comfortable in my own skin. So um, I hope I'm not confusing you. I just tell you the truth because I, I see kids, they listen to speakers and they feel, I gotta change and I gotta be like this. No, you don't. If you can get the result, being you, being a better version of you, keep doing it. Because see, if I tried to do it your way, I'd be second class. But doing it my way, I'll always be first class. Thank you. I have to give Anna a shout out for helping me organize this. So what HB is talking about, once he agreed, he says, talk to Anna. <laughs> so thank you, Anna, for giving this. Um, so whenever you do big thing, small thing, at some point, what you have to know, you have to build that solid ground when the store comes up, anything so that you don't, you're not shaken. So how do you build a solid ground and be ready for the difficult times, anything that come up? Well, you know, you're always going to have, here's the thing I want you to understand. Um, life always is going to throw curveballs at you. It, it always will. Um, and, and life hits you in several areas. As soon as you decide to do something special, here's what's going to appear. And I promise you, you're going to notice this in your, in your life. As soon as you make a decision to do something great, Here's what's going to happen. You're going to have some kind of issue from a family standpoint that's going to be relationship based. It may be also a financial issue. And then there's some health issues that pop up. These things always take place. It's called life. But it becomes so much bigger because you're about to make a decision. And it may not be your health. It may be grandma. It may be grand. It may be a kid. Or I'm not saying something bad. But relationship wise or whatever it is, that's the universe seeing. Do you really want this? Do you really want what you say you want? I, I never forget. I was launching the company back in 2008 when Hurricane Katrina hit. And with Hurricane Katrina hit, Houston had we had uh, a huge storms as well. And I'll never forget my mom calling up. She said, son, you need to get your family. Get to Dallas. Get out of there. The, whole, the hurricane is coming. Now, don't follow my advice on this. But I said, mom, I don't have time for a hurricane. I'm launching a company this week. <laughs> you know? and, and, and so, uh, and it was the biggest, it was the biggest success I've ever had in business. But I was prepared. Why well, I already knew that I had this huge dream. And anytime you got a huge dream, obstacles are going to come all the time. And so, you know, um, and, and, and you prepare yourself. And I tell people this, don't, People have a saying and parents will tell you, you know, um, you know what they say, expect the best, prepare for the worst. Don't ever do that. Prepare for the best. Why in the world would I why would I go to college for four or five years preparing for the worst? See, that's that broken mentality or that broken sense of awareness that our parents pass on to us that we don't. They don't even know what they're saying. And, and you know what we do? We use it over and over and over again. Expect the best, prepare for the worst. No, I am expecting the best and I'm preparing for the best. Because if I prepare for the best, I may not get the best, but I'm not going to get the worst. I'm going to get a lot better than what the worst is. And so... Um, just understand life is going to throw its, 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 its lemons at you. And when they throw lemons at you, you make lemonade, you know, and I always try to find 
the opportunity in an obstacle. I never analyze the obstacle and justify it. What's the opportunity in this obstacle here? Um, and, 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 and in that, you got to have a sense of compassion as well. Why? I understand everybody don't think like me. And, and everybody don't feel like, oh, I'm just as strong as you to, to look at it that way. Um, but I understand that and I do have compassion and I don't judge people who don't think my way. But you guys are leaders. And this is why I'm talking to you like this, because I, I want you to know the real deal. You know, have compassion, but expect the best. Prepare for the best. You know, when, 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 when God made you, there was a lot of other competitors that was trying to fertilize that egg. Only mm. one of y'all. <laughs> Only one. You got. Do you know you got a billion twins? <laughs> okay. And 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 so the slowest one didn't make it. The best, the best one was the one that was able to fertilize the egg, and that was you. And so walk into that excellence that you have. That's not excellence above anybody else thinking that you're better. Than, it's just knowing who you are, whose you are, and how you are. And and um, but yeah, be just be prepared for excellence and expect it. And uh, some of the questions that do come up is um, we want to be belong. I mean, sometimes having personal responsibility versus the group part. When do you say the I should be bigger than the we? When does the we become big, bigger than the I? Here's how it is in leadership. And when you're working with other people, when something goes good on the team, it is we. When something goes bad, it's I. When our company messes up, I did it. When our company do something good, you did it. That's just a sign of a leader because a leader takes personal responsibility. Um, and, and so that comes with, with, with giving credit. I always have a, my, the team is more important than my team uh, perspective. Meaning that I can't put my personal agenda before the company or the team or the group or the class. So something may be critically important to me, but if it's a team operated event, no, the team agenda precedes my agenda. So I only comes into place when I'm alone or when I'm taking total responsibility. Those are the only two times that I use I. When I, what are the things that you don't compromise? Like priorities, things that you will not, um, uh, that you say every day, these are my priorities that I will never compromise. Give, give me one second here. Let me let me let me grab this this door. Hold on one second. One second. Be back for those while we're waiting for HP. You're watching the Yofta Hate Show on YouTube and Facebook. Please share, like, link, and then anything that you can um, share with families and friends. I will definitely appreciate it. Uh, we do have a show coming up this Saturday that all of you want to be part of, especially talking about art, because not every kid has to be a doctor or an engineer, and there are some art that we have to encourage as parents. So this Saturday, I have a big lineup for all of you to be able to watch. Parents are listening <clears throat> that we have to give our kids the opportunity to be able to do uh, what they can and want to do. So please make sure to follow us this Saturday at 12 noon. I'm going to be lining up plenty of artists talking about the art world as a journey to free the soul. So make sure to join us at the program this Saturday at 12 noon. Um, HP is back, so let me get back to you. Yeah, you know, uh, the answer to your question in terms of what is it that I don't compromise, um, I don't compromise my principles. Um, I'm not perfect, but, I, but I, 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 I realize that living life on a set of principles, uh, it allows, principles basically are negotiations that you do before the circumstance comes up. 
Okay. So it's like a contract. You make a contract with the person before the problem ever occurs. So if the problem occurs, you refer back to contract. This is what we talked about. So I'll give you an example. I don't loan money to no one. Mom, dad, best friend, whoever, it doesn't matter. It's a principle that I have, not because I don't have the money. It's because I realize that that it, it ruins relationships. So if I'm not willing to give it to you, you don't get it. I don't violate that. I don't care who you are. Doesn't matter how bad your story is. I don't loan money. And I recommend adopt that philosophy. Never loan money to people unless you want them out of your life. Because that's what's normally going to happen. I'm going to recommend a book to you guys as well. Uh, it's called The Parable of the Pipeline. I want you to learn. I want you to learn the root philosophy of money and the economic system that we have. And this book is a very old book and it's written in old times. It's by an author's name is George Clayson, The Parable of the Pipeline. This is the book that I give to all kids who graduate from high, uh, you know, family members who graduate from high school because I wish somebody would have given it to me. So I don't violate that. Um, I don't violate uh, and, and do things that I don't feel good about. If it's if it's something that's not aligned in here, I don't do it. I don't. If, if, you know, I, I trust my my gut. I trust my spirit. I don't. I don't violate certain you know certain philosophies uh, you know that I have. And so you know, in my, in my, in my belief system, um, and and so. Those are just things that I, I just don't compromise. If it comes to my principles, when it comes to my, my philosophies, when it comes to my belief systems, um, those are non-negotiable, uh, no matter what the outcome is on the other side. And, and that's also what makes you a, a person of, um, of, of empathy and a person of humanity, having principles. Thank you. Halton, you've been amazing, learned so much. I'm gonna be rewatching this video over and over again. And for all of you to share. So I'm gonna close it with one question, maybe like a part of question that I really learned from John Maxwell. And then you can close it in any way that you want. <clears throat> what makes you cry? What makes you smile? And what do you dream about? Okay. Uh, you know, what, ma what makes me cry uh, is when I see, you know, when I when I go back and look at pictures of of my family, and I hear and I see my family, my wife, my mom, and I think about um, how far we've come. Not necessarily. I'm not talking financially, but just I knew where we were, and so I've got this right outside my office where I am now. I've got this this receptacle all kind of photos and stuff. And so when I look back and I think about those and I, and I do it every now and then, I just go through the pictures and 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 sometimes it'll it'll make me cry. Uh, when I hear my son tells, you know, you know, get a little sentimental with dad, you know, I kind of rush him off the phone because it may, may get me a little teary eyed or whatever it is, but that's what makes me uh, cry. What makes me smile is, is when I watch people succeed. Um, it, there's nothing like, watching people get it you know there's nothing like watching someone overcome watching someone face the obstacle um, size the obstacle up and design a plan to overcome the obstacle no matter what it is it makes me it makes me smile family and being around family for me that's what's important um, is family it makes me smile being around those that I love and things that uh, the things that I uh, that I dream about. Uh, I I dream about everything that's important to me. Um, but my my dream is really always about what's next that allows me to impact the world a little bigger than I did on my previous dream. Um, and those are the things that I 
that I dream about um, outside of the occasional the occasional dreams that I may have of whatever's on my mind. <laughs> you know, before I go to bed, I'm going to dream about it. Um, but my vision and my real dream is is impacting the world. You know, uh, I, I've got a definite of purpose. And that was I developed that a while back. And that is uh, uh, positively impacting the lives of over 100 million people personally, uh, spiritually, financially. And so why would I come on and do a call like this? Because this is one step. As I told you, success is a progressive realization of a dream. This is one step in the direction of being able to accomplish my definition of purpose and being able to pass it on to you guys. And, and when you guys take one item that you learn from me and you impact somebody, it's a check mark on my scorecard. So I get to keep it, not only you. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. This has been an amazing evening. Like I said, I know how busy you are and you've been gracious enough to give us this hours. So Abraham, Nardo, and Salam, I appreciate you also. You are the next generation who will be able to take over the model and follow through. So everything you learned today is valuable as long as you apply it. It's not listening, don't store it away. Go back and watch it again, take notes, and apply one thing. If you can apply at least one thing that you learned today, you will get where you to get. So once again to the viewer. Uh, question, could, I, could, I, could, I, could I dare give you one point of correction on what you just told them? Sure, of course. You, you told you guys that you're the next generation. You're not. You're the now generation. No. <laughs> right now. Your time is not coming. Your time is right now. So that's the only thing I would say. Other than that, Adam, you've been absolutely phenomenal. Thanks for having me on. Phenomenal. Like I said, thank you to everyone, the viewers. I appreciate you. I want to see you again next Saturday at 12 noon. So everyone, I wish you a good night. Halton Box, again, please watch his profile. Uh, this is not an easy time for him to give us all this valuable time. So you can't don't even pay for this time. So, but we appreciate all of you. I wish you a good night. See you Saturday. Thank you. Have a good day. Absolutely. All right, guys. Let's keep in touch.